Hello, I'm Noreen Hart, and thanks for joining us again at Silicon Mountain Training. Today we're going to be talking about maintaining your PC. When you purchase your computer, you had high hopes that it was going to work flawlessly forever, just as it did the first day you used it. Hopefully that has been your experience. Maybe you're one of those people who's never had a problem and is working trouble free, and it's been just as predictable as the sun coming up and going down each day. If you're part of that select group, you may also be smugly thinking that nothing's ever going to go wrong. And maybe you're right. However, if you're like the rest of us, things have already broke or at least acting differently than day one. And you're not quite sure what to do about it. You may be thinking that your computer isn't running as fast as it used to. And you may be right. You may have purchased some software and discovered that it would have run much better if you were using a mouse. Windows and Windows related products are a prime example. Once you buy a mouse, how do you install it? Again, in the case of Windows, you may be finding that your applications are running a little slow, and indications are that you need more memory. What do you do with that once you get it? And why did your monitor suddenly go blank on you that one day when you had three hours worth of unsaved work keyed in? In this session, we're going to be taking a look at all of these items. We'll be discussing your computer's environment and how it can affect its performance and its lifespan. We're going to go through some troubleshooting exercises and discover that a major problem may not be as serious as you first thought. We're also going to look at common hardware installations. Throughout, we're going to be emphasizing the role of common sense and what it can play in all areas. While every precaution is made by the manufacturer to ensure that your computer will serve you well, it is made up of mechanical devices and each one of which can fail at any point in time. And that time is never really convenient. Today, we will be giving you some tips on how, with a combination of common sense and a bit of technical knowledge, that you can help to keep your computer running smoothly and productively. And perhaps even save yourself some money by avoiding costly service bills. You may never join that group that never has and never will have problems. But when they do occur, you'll have a much better sense of the steps to take to resolve them. What can go wrong? Simply anything and everything. The term computer encompasses a monitor, keyboard, and a central processing unit, or a CPU, which in turn encompasses a hard drive, one or more floppy drives, memory, and an ever-increasing number of add-ons, which could include fax machines, modems, CD-ROM, tape drives, and even hookups to your cable TV. An old adage with computers is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. This is perhaps partly wise in the case of software, where a minor enhancement can cause all kinds of unpredictable results, and even bring your computer to its logical knees. However, with hardware, it's not the same. The adage that applies here is, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Anything that you can do to keep your computer happy will keep you ahead of the game. The first step in keeping a computer running well is to provide it with a good environment. Important considerations are electricity, static, temperature, and dust. Try to dedicate the AC circuit that you're using to your computer and its components to prevent overload and power spikes. Certain appliances, such as blenders and mixers, don't take a lot of power to turn them on. If your computer is on the same circuit as any one of these and is running when that appliance is started, a variation in the voltage will occur. It may not even be noticeable to you, but damage can occur. To prevent this, purchase a power strip that includes an adequate surge protector to keep the voltage constant, and plug your computer components into that. While on the subject of power, a frequent question concerns whether or not to leave your computer on indefinitely while idle. The best rule here is common sense. It is a fact that wear and tear does occur each time the computer is turned on, giving strength to the argument to leave it on. If, however, you are experiencing inclement weather, by all means, turn it off. 
Damage from lightning strikes at times is very evident, but it can be extremely subtle and a problem may not be apparent immediately. And when things begin to get a little flaky, several months later, it's very difficult to identify the origin. Generally speaking, you can leave your computer on indefinitely. But if you're leaving your workplace for an extended period of time, or if the weather is bad, turn it off. Another form of electricity that can be detrimental to your computer is static electricity. This can build up when you walk across your carpeted floor to your computer. If you then touch your monitor screen with your finger, a spark may be released and your screen could go blank. At a minimum, it would be necessary to reboot and start over. Damage could occur to your monitor or to the card it plugs into. To avoid this situation, use anti-static spray on your carpets, get an anti-static pad for your desktop under your computer, and clean your screen frequently with anti-static spray. Temperature control is also important. While maintaining a precise temperature and humidity level are not vital, excess heat can hurt or destroy delicate chips in your computer. In a like manner, if your workplace is too cool, your disk drives may not turn fast enough. You may experience difficulties reading files, and you may not even be able to reboot your computer. In addition to the room temperature, the internal computer temperature is critical to proper operation. Always leave room for the CPU to breathe. Do not allow anything to block the exhaust fan, or overheating will occur. If a circuit board is removed, be sure to reinsert the small metal expansion slot cover in the back of the CPU. This seemingly small item is part of the overall temperature control system. Reinstalling that will also help keep out the dust. No matter how meticulous you are, dust will find its way into your work area. You should keep it as dust-free as possible. Dust covers for monitors and keyboards are recommended. Dust can enter your CPU through the air intake slots. Some will leave with the help of the exhaust fan and some will remain. Over a period of time, internal components will become coated with it. When this happens, the temperature control system will not be operating at its optimum level. Miniature vacuum cleaners are obtainable at retail stores and are quite effective at controlling dust levels. If you're hesitant to remove the CPU cover, the store will take care of this for you, but it will cost you some money. We'll be getting inside a computer later on in this session. You may just want to do this yourself, so stay tuned. Cigarette smoking around computers is also discouraged. In addition to the ashes that can enter the machine, the smoke itself contains particles that can coat and clog internal parts. Hard drives are sealed and inaccessible, but floppy drives can collect dust. Inexpensive drive cleaning kits are available. They typically consist of a diskette covered with a felt-like material. Insert the diskette and execute a command that will activate the drive, such as a colon. The drive will spin and the diskette material will rub against the read-write heads. It is a very simple procedure and very important for extending the life of your drive, but it should not be done too often as it can cause wear and tear on your disk read-write heads. In a clean environment, two or three times per year should be sufficient. Diskettes should always be placed in their protective sleeves and kept in covered storage boxes. Visually inspect a diskette before using it. If it is dusty, blow the dust off. But please, use common sense. Don't blow in the direction of your computer. The dust that would have gone into your floppy drive will instead go into the CPU cabinet. Take the diskette to another location before cleaning it. Although it is a common practice, sometimes dictated by available space, it may not be a good idea to set your monitor on top of your CPU. CPU covers, depending on the brand, may be somewhat flimsy with no internal means of support for such a heavy piece of equipment, which will cause your cover to sag. You daily go through a troubleshooting thought process whether or not you actually realize it. Balancing a checkbook, getting a flashlight to work, or planning a family outing. In short, any activity where there is a potential for some rough edges puts you in a troubleshooting mode. A problem and its solution can generally be broken down into smaller parts. 
When each of these parts is investigated, the task becomes much easier. You probably wouldn't contact an electrician for a service call if a table lamp was malfunctioning without first considering each of its components. The lamp consists of a light bulb, socket, switch, wire, and plug. Researching and perhaps replacing each of these pieces will eventually resolve the problem. This is also true of your computer, and while it can be an intimidating piece of machinery, it too can be broken down into individual parts. True, a few more than a table lamp, but in the overall picture, some software, perhaps a few tools, and again, some common sense, it's possible to be back in business within a reasonable time frame. The table lamp may just have a burned out bulb, and your computer may simply have a loose cable. The most basic of problems that can occur is, my computer won't turn on. It may be surprising that one of the more common solutions is that it isn't plugged in. It should not be considered an insult to your intelligence when someone asks you this after you've called for help. Look in the troubleshooting section of the owner's manual for any of your appliances, small or large, and you will find this step. If your computer is on a dedicated circuit, your circuit may be interrupted. Plug something else into it and see if it works. If it doesn't, Reset the circuit on your main power box. It's also possible that even though it's plugged in, your power strip has been turned off. If that appears okay, check the power connection into the back of your computer. You should note that we have just checked four possible problems in an orderly, logical manner, going step by step from the circuit breaker to your computer. If the problem is not resolved by now, it is likely that there is a problem inside your computer possibly in your power supply, and you will either need to call for service or take your computer into a service center. If your monitor does not display anything, or if what it does display appears to be an error, the problem could normally be narrowed down to three items. The monitor itself, the cable connecting the monitor to the computer, and the adapter card inside the computer. To check the cabling, power off the computer and monitor and be sure that the cable head is securely fastened to the computer. Most monitors are hardwired. The cable comes directly out of the monitor, so the only connection you can check is at the computer. Power the computer back on to see if the problem is resolved. Error messages on the screen indicate various problems, and in the case of monitor problems, are dictated by the adapter type in your machine. For example, if you have a monochrome monitor, an error message of 4XX would indicate a problem is being reported by the monochrome adapter card. 5XX messages appear for CGA adapters, and 74XX are for VGAs. There are many combinations, and your DOS documentation should be consulted. Generally speaking, if your monitor is healthy enough to display an error message, it's probably okay. Switch settings on the adapter card could be wrong, or the DOS mode command could have been executed with inappropriate parameters. If you have not made any changes to your system, you probably won't see these messages. But knowing where to look for answers is the first step in solving the problem. Crackling sounds, or an electrical smell, are indicative of dirt and dust inside your monitor, or a problem with the monitor's internal voltage regulator. In either event, disconnect the monitor and take it in for service. Don't attempt to service the monitor yourself. The voltage in there can be pretty high. Strange characters on the screen or displaying of a wrong color may be due to the lack of or an improper reference to a file named ANSYSYS located in one of your startup files, ConfigSys. ANSYSYS contains display control commands and is provided for you by DOS. It is generally found in your DOS subdirectory. The config sys file needs a line such as device equals c colon backslash DOS backslash ansysys. If it is not present, add it with a text editor and then reboot your machine. An added note regarding prolonging the life of your monitor. After a period of time, Images that remain in the same position on your screen can become burned into the screen, 
This damage is permanent. Screensaver software can be purchased to circumvent this condition. The software will run in the background and can be set to execute after a predefined period with no activity. Mouse motion or a keystroke will restore your screen right where you left it. It's true that turning down the brightness on your monitor will also save your screen, but typically screens are left on because you were sidetracked and walked away to work on something else. It's easier if you just let the computer take care of it for you. Windows provides you with a variety of screensavers and you can set their execution to a time period with which you are comfortable. Most often, troubleshooting procedures will lead you down a structured path, and the cause of the problem can be found without too much trouble. However, you occasionally may take a wrong fork in the road, and while these experiences can sometimes lead to humorous memories, they aren't much fun while you're going through them. An important note, don't jump to conclusions. If you insert a diskette, and it cannot be read, it may not be the diskette. It may not even be the drive. Your configuration program could be the culprit, and the drive could be defined in error, even though it was OK the last time you used it. A ribbon cable between your drive and controller board could be bad, and there could even be a loose screw inside that from time to time causes a short circuit. There will be times when you're stumped, but once again, if you try to think of the problem in terms of its component parts and all the things that could go wrong with each piece, the answer will frequently be forthcoming. Make a checklist of each part involved, what the problems with the part could be, and what you will do to try to eliminate the part as the source of the problem, and then the success or failure of each step. Your hard drive can contain thousands of files. This data is your lifeline. If you can't get at them or you lose them, you're out of luck. One way to help ensure that this link isn't broken is by doing frequent backups. Backups are boring, so are they really necessary? No, they're really not. Not until you've lost just one vital file. Then they will seem very necessary. DOS provides you with backup and restore commands. But other products, such as FastBack, Central Point Backup, and Norton Backup, are better. They are faster and use fewer diskettes. They have better data compression schemes. In addition, they use various methods of error checking to ensure that the data can later be restored, even if you had disk damage present. DOS Backup and Restore also are not totally reliable and use different formatting methods for different versions of DOS. For example, if you had backed up your files using DOS 5.0 and experienced disk failure, you would not be able to restore on another machine that happened to have DOS 3.3. You would have to install your backup software on the other computer, but that is a lot easier than installing another version of DOS. Granted, backing up data is tedious. Backing up 50 megabytes of data on high density, three and a half inch diskettes will take approximately 35 diskettes. If you're using five and a quarter inch, 360K diskettes, you're going to need about 150 of those. And someone will have to be there to insert each diskette. A preferred medium today for backup is magnetic tape. These tapes look like audio cassettes, and standard storage capacities are 125 or 250 megabytes, although they also come in larger sizes. The tape drives can be mounted internally or plugged in externally and can be purchased for as little as $200. You can spend nearly that much for all the diskettes you will otherwise need to have on hand, and the area needed for storage will be minuscule by comparison. With the size of today's hard drives, all of your data can generally fit on one tape. This is a vast improvement over the diskette method. A backup plan should be defined. Frequency and method should be determined by your perceived need. All backup and restore software has options to either backup all your files or only those files that have changed since your last backup. Here are a couple of suggestions. The more frequent the procedure and the larger your disk drive, the more tape backup should be considered. Ten sets of tapes are needed. 
They are labeled Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Week 1, Week 2, Week 3, and Month 1, Month 2, and Month 3. Each Monday, do a full backup on Monday's tape. Repeat for Tuesday through Thursday using their respective tapes. On Friday, back up to the week one tape, and so on. On the fourth week, use month one. And after month three has been used, use the month one tape over again. It is also recommended that backup files be stored off-site. They don't have to be sent to a steeled vault 200 feet below the ground in a distant state. But on the other hand, all backup procedures you can devise will do little good if your place of work is damaged by fire or water. Backup also relates to software you have purchased. The first thing mentioned in any manual is a recommendation to copy your new diskettes, label them, and store them in a safe place. If it seems to you that your processing isn't quite as fast as it used to be, it just may be true. As files are added to your hard drive, DOS will put them anywhere it can find room. A file can be fragmented with pieces of it all over your drive. In addition, if you have deleted an application, DOS will look at this as free space and a subsequent installation will begin to use it up. If it doesn't all fit in one place, it too will be split up into pieces in different locations on the drive. All this fragmentation eventually results in slow access. The drive may be working just as hard and fast, but it has a lot more to do, and from your point of view, it's just plain slower. There are several software products on the market that will reorganize your drive. One of these is called SpeedDisk and is found in the Norton Utilities package. Also, DOS version 6.0 has now included a defrag command which will perform the same utility. When running it, the software will display a graphic layout of your drive, and you can watch all the pieces being reorganized into some semblance of order. There are other packages on the market as well to defragmentize your files. Depending on the shape your disk is in, you may very well see an improvement in speed after running it. When you're purchasing software, be sure to shop around. Prices can vary a lot between stores. Buying by mail order is generally cheaper than buying from a retail store. All software comes with diskettes. Some companies provide both sizes, both 5 and a quarter inch and the 3 and a half inch. But many software packages are shipped with just one size, and that'll be marked on your box. If your computer has just one style of floppy disk drive, be certain that the diskettes that you are going to buy will fit. At a minimum, getting the wrong size will mean another trip back to the store. If you purchase them by mail, it'll be a few days turnaround before you'll have your software in hand, which, depending on your available time, could be critical. Software packages also come with a manual. Read the installation portion carefully before starting to keep surprises down to a minimum while installing. Good documentation will tell you what things you will see and what options that you will have to select from during the install process. In an effort to get you up and running as quickly and easily as possible, installation procedures for today's software have become quite sophisticated. To save on the number of diskettes in a package, software typically comes compressed. The installation procedure will decompress it. Also, some companies allow you to select a generic versus a custom installation. Many times, the software can determine details about your computer's configuration so that you don't have to bother with it. It will also make a recommendation as to where the software will go on your hard drive. Unless you have specific reasons for not doing so, it is generally wise to take the defaults presented to you in the installation procedure. Here is a case where you may want to override the suggested directory. If you have organized your hard drive into very general categories such as play and work, and you have just purchased a new game called Rugby Masters. 
you will very likely will want to install it into a new subdirectory under Play. At some point, a screen will appear with some wording like, Rugby Masters is normally installed into the directory C colon backslash rugby. If you wish to install it elsewhere, enter correct path. You could input a path such as C backslash games rugby and push enter and let the installation continue with your hard drive's organization intact. There may also be choices as to whether or not you want to install all available modules of the package. If you have plenty of space available on your hard drive, it's a good idea to accept all the options, then remove them later if you find you're not using some of them. The interface sockets on the back of your computer can be a source for confusion, especially when the terms parallel port and serial port are mentioned. Let's try to dispense with some of the mystique. A serial port can be identified by a 9 or 25 pin connector on your computer. Data is sent one bit at a time through one of the pins. A parallel port has 25 pin female connector and uses 8 of the pins to send 8 bits or one byte at a time. Since all 8 bits are transmitted concurrently, they are said to be moving in a parallel manner. Because they are closely tied to communications, Several connections are called COM ports and are referred to as COM1, COM2, COM3, and COM4. When defined properly, they can become your link to the rest of the world, but defining them can at times be difficult and confusing. It is very likely that your computer came with COM1 and COM2 already installed. They can be recognized by the 9 or 25 pin mail connectors on the back of your computer. For example, an external modem can plug into one of these ports with a serial cable. If you have both types of connectors, it's a good bet that the 9-pin connector is COM1 and the 25-pin connector is COM2. The software you are using with the modem also needs to know which of these ports you are using. It will have a screen that allows you to set up communications parameters and the COM port will be one of these. It's probably preset to COM1. To determine whether or not that this is correct, try having your modem dial your own number. If your COM port is wrong, you'll get a no carrier message on your screen, indicating that your computer is not communicating with your modem. Change the software setting to COM2 and then try again. It should work. And your call to yourself should result in the modem receiving a busy signal. Defining a COM port for an external modem is relatively easy. An internal modem may be a bit more difficult. COM port assignment conflicts are a very common problem and can be rather frustrating. Even if you have nothing physically plugged into COM1 or COM2 connectors, they are still considered in use if they are installed in your computer, and they will create a conflict situation if you try to use them for your internal modem. If COM1 and COM2 have been configured in your computer, you must use COM3 for an internal modem. If COM3 is in use, use COM4. Some computers and some versions of DOS will not allow you to skip a COM port. In other words, you may not be able to use COM3 unless COM1 and COM2 are already in use. Again, external modems are fairly easy to install, but with internal modems, in addition to the selection of the correct port number, DOS provides us with yet another wrinkle to further confuse us, the interrupt request. To recognize devices attached to your computer, such as a keyboard, hard drive, and yes, COM ports, DOS uses a number to identify the device called the interrupt request number, abbreviated to IRQ, followed by the number. IRQ4 is used to identify COM1 and COM3, and IRQ3 is used for COM2 and COM4. You will see IRQs mentioned in your installation manual. The correct number may be assigned in your software through a screen option, or it may be a jumper or a switch on the board you are installing. The important thing to be aware of is that if you change your COM port designation during installation, 
it may also be necessary to change the IRQ number as well. Confused? It's not surprising. Serial ports can be a quite formidable foe. At times, the solution to a communications problem seems to be a little more than trial and error. If after trying all combinations of COM ports and IRQs with no success, call your dealer for assistance. He should be able to get you on the right track. Let's turn to the subject of hardware add-ons. Today, there are many extras that can be added to your computer. And tomorrow, there will be even more. One of the most common and most useful is the mouse. We'll be describing mouse installation here. But all concepts and tips also pertain to modems. A lot of retailers are now providing you with a mouse when you purchase your computer, especially if they're also including Windows in the sale. But if your computer did not come with a mouse and you now feel the need for one, don't despair. They're not that hard to install. While the business end of a mouse is functionally pretty standard, there are actually two very different methods for interfacing it to your computer. You may have heard the terms serial mouse and bus mouse. The serial mouse has a plug on it that connects to the serial port on the back of your computer. If your mouse cable has a 9 pin or 25 pin female connector on the end, it's a serial mouse. And like an external modem, it is simply plugged in to one of the serial ports. You will also need to assign it to COM1 or COM2 in the software. If your serial port is in use, or you anticipate that it will be, you're going to need to purchase a bus mouse. An adapter card that will need to be installed is provided with the mouse, and the connection at the end of the cable will plug right into the card. Carefully read the manual to see if there are any jumper or switch settings that you're going to need to adjust on the card. This is the tricky part. Your mouse card will come with factory settings, which are defaults that will work in most cases. They may not work, however, in your system. Once again, the subject of COM port and IRQ combinations come into play. You must assign values that are not already in use. The documentation should provide charts, pictures, and recommendations for the proper settings. To install the card, you will have to get inside the CPU. If your computer is the vertical or tower type, you'll have to shift your thinking 90 degrees. All of the parts and concepts are the same, though. Be sure that the computer is turned off and the power is disconnected. On the computer, you will find some screws around the perimeter. Remove them to release the cover. Do not remove any screws that are away from the perimeter. Some of them secure the power supply. The cover should come off relatively easily. If it doesn't, there may be a key interlock holding it on or near the front of the machine. Once the cover has been removed, you will see a conglomeration of boxes, wires, and boards inside. The box with all the wires coming out of it in this machine is the power supply. Here are the floppy drives, and this is the hard drive. The large board lying flat in the bottom of the computer is the motherboard. Toward the back of the machine and on the left, you will see some boards inserted into slots in the motherboard. Each slot is called a bus. These boards have a variety of functions. One controls your hard and floppy drives, one controls your monitor, and another drives your serial and parallel ports. Another may hold expanded memory. Find an available slot and remove the metal expansion slot cover. Be sure to save it. Someday, you may have cause to remove the mouse from this computer, perhaps to install it in another. As we have mentioned before, this piece of metal is part of the temperature system and assists in dust control. Gently, but firmly, insert the card into the slot. The notch in the top should line up with the hole in the frame where you just removed the screw. Replace the screw and plug the mouse into the back of the card. Power up the computer. Do not replace the cover yet. We don't know if the board settings are correct. Whether you have a serial or bus mouse, the software that came with it will need to be installed. Follow the installation instructions in your documentation. Reboot your computer and execute a program that you know will make use of your mouse. If it works, congratulations. 
you've just saved yourself some money on a service call. If this is a bus mouse, power off the computer, replace the cover, and start it up again. If it didn't work, recheck the documentation to see that there were no software options that were overlooked or entered incorrectly. Reboot the computer to see if any error messages appear in the startup message sequence. If nothing is apparent, power off and pull the board back out. Check on the settings again as described in your manual. Sometimes it seems that trial and error is the only answer. Remember, and this is very important, be sure the power is off anytime you are inserting or removing a board. A lot of damage can be done to the delicate circuitry while the power is on. To say nothing of the circuitry in your body, the voltage can get pretty high. If you feel that you have exhausted all your options and your level of frustration is getting high, stop experimenting and call your retailer for help. A small piece of device is appropriate here. When we get frustrated, we tend to make more errors than normal. It's better to leave it alone for a while rather than risk breaking something else. This procedure is very similar for other card installations such as video accelerator and internal modem fax machine cards. For all installations, make a note of any special setting such as your final IRQ selections. Believe me, it will be most helpful during your next installation to know what options you still have available. While we have the cover off, let's look at memory. Some programs nowadays use a lot of it, and you may have to increase yours. This comes both extended and extended memory. We won't get into any real details as to which types are used for what, but it should be noted that extended memory is typically plugged into the motherboard, and expanded is configured on an expansion card. On a 386 motherboard, extended memory sockets are usually found on the left side near the front of the machine, while on a 486, they are toward the rear near the power supply. Perhaps the most common type of memory available for 386 and 486 computers is called SINs, which stands for Standard Inline Memory Modules. They are considered extended memory. They are about two inches long by a quarter inch wide and plug into sockets on the motherboard. They can contain 256K or 4 per megabyte, a single megabyte or 4 megabytes per plug. Some have 7 small chips per plug called a 1x7 and some have 9 or a 1x9. They are rated at different speeds in nanoseconds. The speed of the memory you select should match the internal speed of your computer. A reputable computer retailer can make recommendations for you. However, before visiting the retailer, you should determine what type of memory you have, either by looking at your original documentation or by removing the cover. There may be configuration concerns as well. You may have a total of eight slots available for memory, each of them containing 256K plugs for a total of two megabytes. To expand to four megabytes, you will have to remove four of the existing plugs and replace them with three one megabyte plugs. The order in which they are inserted is important. Your retailer can also help you with this. The installation itself is rather simple. Be sure though that you understand what the retailer is telling you. Once the memory is installed and the cover has been replaced, power up the computer. While it goes through its startup procedure, it will get confused because the configuration table no longer matches the actual memory now in your machine. It will stall and report an error, then ask you to press F1 to continue. Go ahead and press F1, and the configuration table will be updated. That's the last you'll have to worry about it. Make a system diskette. Use DOS format and check the DOS manual for the specific parameters needed. Copy some external DOS commands to it, such as fdisk, format, unformat, and check disk to it. 
as well as the restore command from whatever backup software package you choose. These will be valuable in case of hard disk problems. If the programs reside only on your hard disk, you may not be able to use them. Use load density, the default, in case your configuration is lost, since your high density drives may not be recognized. And keep some systems utility software, oh, from Norton Utilities or PC Tools, for example, on a diskette. Since today's software frequently comes compressed, it needs to be installed to your hard drive. Then selected files need to be copied back to a floppy to be used later. Your most recent hard drive backup, while not on site, should be accessible in case a restore is needed. In case you have to get inside the cabinet, you should also have an inexpensive toolkit handy that includes screwdrivers, long nose pliers, and long tweezers just in case you drop a screw inside the cabinet. Be sure that your tools are non-magnetized. Magnets around computers are like kryptonite around Superman. If you should have to call for help, there are a few things to remember. First, call a reliable local retailer who deals primarily in computers, even if it's not the place where you purchased your machine. Next, keep in mind that the retailer may not be able to help you if you have a problem with a particular software or hardware. It is likely that you will have to call the manufacturer's technical support line. And if you bought your computer from, oh, for example, an appliance retailer, he may have more expertise in refrigerators and stereos than in computers. Before calling, make a list of specific symptoms that you can refer to when talking with the service representative. Simply exclaiming, my PC is broken, with no real details are not particularly helpful to the technician. Don't get exasperated if his questions seem very trivial or if he asks you to try things you've already done. After all, you're the one calling him for help, and there may have been some trivial, seemingly inconsequential little step that you missed. In fact, this is often the case. So follow his directions to the letter, keystroke by keystroke, and be sure to ask to have things repeated if you don't quite understand. Get the person's name in case you have to call back. There's no point in repeating your whole story to another person if you don't have to. Keep a master sheet of all the details for your system. Keep a small notebook to help you remember little things that have gotten you in trouble in the past. History does repeat itself, and it's surprising that sometimes the same little glitch can happen again way down the road. If you documented it carefully last time, you already have an instant manual for getting yourself fixed this time. In addition, this manual will be tailored to your machine and may include things not found in a published manual. We hope that you've enjoyed today's session and some of the mystery surrounding your computer has gone away. We stress the importance of a good environment, troubleshooting methods, and basic installation tips. We've also mentioned some software that can assist in helping you maintain a good relationship with your computer. To keep that car of yours running smoothly for a long period of time without failing when you need it most, you'll probably keep up with periodic maintenance. Do the same with your computer and it should serve you well for a long time.